Welcome to um, another session. I, I hope you are well. I'd like to uh, start today's session by uh, encouraging you to, uh, if you haven't subscribed already, uh, to join join the channel by subscribing. Uh, but I'd like to ask for something that I think would be more beneficial. Um, I admit beneficial to myself, which is to leave a comment. Um, I leave my comment sections open intentionally um, and deliberately. The purpose of which is so I can I can get the pushback I need. Um, some of the ideas I share are not necessarily perceived to be consistent with the consensus or groupthink. Some of the thoughts that I share um, perhaps are different to what most people believe. It's also part of my lived experience, um, but there are other experiences that other people have had. What I am after, and what I believe in strongly, is the truth. Uh, in many ways, I can only follow a trajectory of the, what I consider to, to be the true line. In other words, think about yourself as um, flying a plane. You have an idea about where you are, you have an idea about your destination and you're traveling in that direction. Now, as you fly, you have some turbulence. Uh, sometimes the winds, uh, the rain, the factors of the environment pushes the plane to one side or the other. Truth is like the center of a town. There are several pathways, several roads, uh, several walkways, routes to get to the center of town, all of which will bring you to the center of town. Some will bring you via a much more uh, comfortable travel experience and some will be a lot more difficult. Some will take longer and some will be uh, much quicker. But truth is the center of town. Now what is true, however, is that you're seeking where that center might be. And that means we squiggle, we never go in a straight line. And so what I share is in many ways my pursuit of the truth, but by me sharing what I believe at this point in time to be true. Now, it may not be your lived experience, but if you've listened to what I've shared in many sessions, I would hope you would have come to one conclusion, which is, I do not necessarily talk about my experience as much. Opinions are important, but facts, data, statistics, are what we call a, an aggregation of so many lived experiences across time, across geographies, and across seasons. And what we do is we, we do what we call a scatter plot. We plot everyone's experiences and we try to find the best fit line. That best fit line is what we call at the pre present time. Um, data set or information is not necessarily the truth. It could be the data available. It could be the information available. We call that a fact. And what we keep doing is collecting more data and using something called the law of large numbers. The more people we aggregate, the standard error reduces because the variance, the standard deviation changes. If two people spoke about all of their experiences, just both of their experiences, then what we will find out the standard error Will be much higher because the sample size is just two. When we aggregate in the UK 87 million people, the standard error shrinks because if you divide, take the, 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 the sample size and you take the square root of the sample size and you divide by that, that amount by the standard deviation, what you find is that the standard error itself is much smaller. Take the sample size, 6 to 8 million people. The square root of 6 to 8 million is a number as such that if you divided the standard deviation by that number, you find that the standard error, the error of the data, becomes minuscule. We've gone from data to fact to the present aggregation of all of our information, we call it statistics, uh, an aggregation of everyone's experiences. It may not still be the truth, the absolute truth. Over time, what we tend to find is that what is true 
go travels beyond geographies and across time, and it follows a trajectory of a line. So, what I share in my sessions are not necessarily supposed to be the only perspective, but it is an aggregation of my lived experience, anecdotal, I should make it very clear, anecdotal, but the study of other people's experiences by looking at the facts, the data, and the statistics across time. And I put my anecdotal experience aside and I simply look at the data and I try to form a conclusion. Now, the reason I recommend you leave a comment is because I understand that perhaps your lived experience is not in that scatter plot. Maybe we need to take your experience and put it in the wider data set and see whether the data set changes. In any case, what we tend to find is if you understand the simple normal distribution, we, 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 we cut out the top 5% and the bottom 5% for surety. And by eliminating the extremes, we find most people live in the average, in the middle. In any case, I ramble on. I encourage you to leave comments, uh, leave your thoughts. And in this particular channel, this is a man's channel. It's for men. It's for men to men, for, for men to, uh, uh, we talk about men issues. Now we invite ladies to join. Why? Because we love and we care about you. And we want you to understand how men think. Because we love women. I am half a woman. Technically speaking, because my genes have come from half of my mother and half of my father. So I cannot talk about men's issues without it reflecting on women. And I cannot talk about women's issues without reflecting on men. My idea here is to teach men how to become as close to possible as their full potential and how to avoid obstacles on the way. My hope is that women can, in learning about how men think, can also achieve the same for themselves. So leave your comments. I, I welcome people who disagree vehemently, people who disagree with a passion. I just say keep it respectful, keep it classy. Um, the use of pejoratives and, and homonyms uh, are not necessary, but you can disagree completely with the, with the logic, the facts, the data, the statistics. You can disagree with the mannerism. You can disagree with anything, the delivery, the tone, um, presentation i welcome everything but leave your comments leave your information and join the conversation if you dislike the information hit the dislike button i have no limitations and i have no restrictions on dislikes or comments everything is welcome now with that said i'd like to talk about something else in today's session uh, i'm going to speak to men some time ago, I, I, I was thinking about how best to, 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 to classify, to separate the, what I consider to be my, my core audience uh, into groups. I realized that just like I have experienced growing up, we all go through stages in life. Um, and so I did something that I thought was simple. I simply said, let me put the boys into and the girls into categories. Zero to 18, 18 to 35, and you might say 36 or 35 and above. Or put it more accurately, zero to 17, 18 to 35 and 36 and above. There's always an overlap. And I said, well, the first group, your first point of learning should not be from a stranger you've never met online. Um, your first source of information and guidance, your foundations, in many ways, what forms who you are. I talk about this, your philosophy, which drives and in many ways influences your character, which forms your morals and your value system and your ethics and then your actions and how you live your life and how you lead your life. It should come from your parents, your, your, your loved ones, uh, your guardians. That should be the first line. And so I, I try not to speak to the first group. I, I jokingly call them my preschoolers. You're not emancipated. Chronologically, you're still not an adult. Despite my recognition that that would be the group I would love to influence the most. 
Because if you can get things right early days, then the probability that you will make mistakes in the latter stages of your life, whether you are a man or a woman, with Jesus, it shrinks, drastically shrinks. The second group between 18 and 35, that is my focus group. As a matter of fact, 99.99% of the people who are my core audience fall within that group. Uh, and um, interestingly, I call those my undergraduate students in, in a joking way. Um, because I remember going to university, uh, going to college, and learning for the first time. You know, I had the preschool knowledge and I came and I, I was looking for a way to think, to add to what I already knew, what my father and my mother had taught me. Um, 36 and above or 35 and above, I call postgraduate students. In a joking way, why? Because you're, you are a mature student. At 35 as a man, yes, there's still a lot to learn, as I learn every day, but there should be some independence to you in knowing how to seek other people and look for voices of wisdom and understanding to make life more meaningful. In today's session, I'm going to talk about to men, uh, but I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to try and speak to the first group and the second group combined. But my main focus this time I deviate, I'm speaking to the preschoolers, the young ones. Um, I have been troubled over the many, many years about the general direction of our society, particularly our society in parts of the Anglosphere, the old um, areas um, that had some roots connecting back to the motherland, Great Britain. We've seen new ideologies come through and we've, unfortunately we've moved away from the need for survival and we are very quickly pursuing whether that be love and belonging, self-esteem or self-actualization. You know, Abraham Maslow talks about the pyramid and how people pursue their needs and how our motivations are driven by uh, where we find ourselves based on our need, either for survival, our need for intimacy and connection, or our need to, to find who we are. And so as we've made ourselves richer in the West, we've broken what I consider to be the foundation stones. Um, and so things are not the way they should be. The, the house is not on good support systems. Uh, it's on rocky grounds. Young men these days, uh, and I, I, I don't know how, a lot of the young men survive. And I'm talking about boys now. Let me perhaps use a better word, boys. Um, because it is very hard uh, to be a man. We have a significant shortage of good role models. The litter that are available uh, constantly being attacked. The role of what it's a man is being attacked. The masculine frame is being diminished. Masculinity is a curse word, is a slur. And so young boys are in a crisis. In today's session, I'm going to speak about four or five things that I believe will help if you are, if you are a young man or perhaps even uh, a young boy. This will be a combination of my lived experience. Anecdotal as it may be, but the data supports this as a pathway to success. There are two critical but very basic things that are needed for long-term success. We separate success into two parts, academic success and long-term life success. The data suggest that the ability to read and write is primarily the key ingredient to academic success. Remember, if you cannot read and you cannot write, your ability to express yourself or interpret information that comes to you becomes limited. There is a correlation, a strong correlation, between the people in prisons and the vocabularies they have. And we correlate that to poor behaviour, which is why they are in prisons, predominantly. The less vocabulary you have about words, the less words you have, the higher the tendency that you will sadly fall into the category of people who misbehave and who 
unfortunately are forced by the law to be put in a place where you have to learn. The more words you learn on a daily basis, the more you expand your mind and the more you're open to new possibilities, opportunities, relationships, people. And the less likely that you will fall within the statistics of people who are failures in life. But first you have to learn how to read and write. The second part is once you've gone past the first, one of the determinant keys, the majority, is delayed gratification. Delayed gratification is the key ingredient to success. The most important, your ability to delay gratification. Now, I don't have to go into the tangential. I don't have to go into the detail. But what it simply says is if you want to be successful, you have to understand delayed gratification. And in delayed gratification, there's so many parts. Grit, passion, a vision, discipline, persistence, tenacity, and the word sacrifice. Sacrifice encompasses com all of those items. Sacrifice is not losing something. It's giving up something of a lower nature to get something of a higher nature. In my sessions, I think one of the things I hope you would have understood so far is I talk a lot about what are you willing to give up to have the life you want? But most importantly, and also just equally as importantly, I should say, what are you willing to give to have what you want? Sacrifice combines both. Sacrifice simply says you're going to be born again, born into the person you should be, dying to your old self, to re be rebirth, rebirth and reborn into your new self. I delay gratification because I realize that a bird in the hand, some would say is worth two in the bush, but I have to invest this bird first to be able to get the two in the bush. Delayed gratification is the key to success because it, it encourages you uh, to, 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 to place needs other than the immediate experience, feeling, uh, gratification, Delay that process. And in doing that, you transcend yourself and you allow yourself to reach your potential. Between where you are as a young boy or young man and where you could be is the word delayed gratification. Most people will fail because they do not know how to delay gratification. Now, what I want to talk about, as I said in today's session, primarily focus on, on younger people. And I would say this will, will start from roughly about seven, age six or seven, and go all the way to about 35. Now, if you're 35, I still consider you a young man. Um, but from 30 and above, you should have some of this already. Um, I don't think what I'm recommending is necessarily going to be applicable to older men, but especially for younger men, particularly men who are much younger, target preschoolers, like I said, from about six or seven, all the way up to about, let me say, uh, uh, mid twenties. Now, all of what I share will not apply to you. So choose what applies to you based on your age and where you find yourself. But I'm going to start and begin with my recommendation, assuming you're as young as possible. Let me put preface this session by saying as follows. In the UK, in England, or England and Wales. If you were to look at families and boys raised and families and even girls to women who were 35 and below or 36 and below, 37 up to 40 and below, what we are finding, this is what the data says, almost 70% of children that are born to that group are born out of wedlock and in more than half of the cases in other words 50 percent of the children being born and more to families that are where the mother is 35 36 37 up to 40 and below there are no fathers in that child's life beyond age two so you have absent fathers mothers do an incredible job but it cannot take one. One does not get the job done for long-term success in a child. 
A single father raising a child is not enough. A single mother raising a child is not enough. As a matter of fact, two parents raising a child is still not enough. What you need is the right checks and balances from good parents playing the actual roles, wearing the archetype of femininity and masculinity, where you have the push and the pull, risk taking, which leads to delayed gratification, rough and tumble play, which encourages leads to delayed gratification, but the nurturing and the love and the sense of belonging and the, and the, and the guidance uh, that comes from a mother. Now, those roles can be played by either party. So this is not necessarily gender specific. Play it properly or when it's present, what you get is like a, a well-made omelette. You crack one egg and you crack the other egg and you make something beautiful. If there is one present in the right way, in the right archetype and frame, and the other is absent, you have a deficient child. So what I am trying to suggest is some things that can be considered both by mothers, but also by the children themselves, or by the young men, to encourage or to ensure, that's the better word, to ensure a greater likelihood of success long term. Number one, because we live in a world where there's a, a boy crisis, a man crisis, a masculinity crisis, a crisis of manhood, an attack on all of those things, you need to be part of a group. You need a tribe. That begins as early as possible in what we used to call Boys Scout. Um, I'm going to say a few things. So if you are a snowflake, just exit stage left now because uh, this is a statement of fact and this applies to most parts of, you might even say the Anglosphere, Canada, the United States, UK, I'm sure now, and Australia. Boys Scout used to be a group that was dedicated to boys where you could join the Boy Scouts and you had the opportunity to be with, learn, travel, experience, and you were provided a structure and a discipline. The data shows that boys who joined Boy Scouts and who stayed and who committed, you earned badges, so it was teaching you delayed gratification and how to be a leader, how to be assertive, how to serve, how to forgive, how to play, how to communicate, how to collaborate. It was incredible. In addition to the support from the family, Boys who were joined and part of a Boy Scout were successful. Emotionally successful, from a societal perspective, successful. In long-term life, successful. Over the past many years, we've, we've seen this cohesion dissolve. In the UK, we have the Scouts, but it's now open to all genders. I have no objections. I think it does some service and some value. Um, but I do think that it is important uh, to, to have your own tribe as a young boy. So you're around other men, so you, you know how to express yourself without fear of rejection, without fear of criticism. And you're expressing it to someone who has the same gender and archetype as you. The Boy Scouts, what you used to find back in the day was men who were very masculine and strong and dominant and assertive. But you also had men who were present, who also had the nurturing side. So you saw both roles played. The way we have the political system, whether you're conservative or whether you're more liberal, checks and balances. The key thing was you were in a space where you could listen to and observe. You may have been seven, but you were in the presence of men, boys who were nine and 11 and 16 and 14, um, and, and it goes on. The point being, uh, you should join a Boy Scout. The younger you are, and mothers, please do this. And it has to be a group exclusive to boys only. We love you ladies, we love women, but when you come into the picture, what we find is that most men, generally most boys, generally struggle with expressing themselves. And we find it even harder when we are supposed to be in a group that is mixed. This is why the whole scout thing doesn't work. And, you know, let me say this uh, directly. Um, in some locations like Canada, what you're finding is some of these scout groups are now being led by women only. 
Now, women cannot lead men. They cannot lead boys, I should say, into masculinity and into man manhood. They just cannot. They cannot. Um, they can try. But what you create is what we've seen over the past 30, 40 years. Very soft, feminine boys who are uh, suppressed and who are not allowed to express themselves. Men who, women who do not understand the, the male biology, testosterone, adrenaline, um, the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we communicate how we feel. We're made to be feminized uh, in the scout team. So first recommendation is find a scout and let it be a boy scout. I think that would help you early understand how to communicate your emotions to men, around men. Learn discipline, structure, boundary enforcement. Boundary setting by your scout leader. Boundary enforcement by the group members. Delay gratification. And here's the key thing. You earn your stripes. Now, assuming this is not available to you, let me give you a second recommendation. Now, I did the first. Number two is actually martial arts. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of martial arts. Uh, let me share a part of my, uh, my upbringing and my, my history. Many years ago, I, many, many years ago, decades ago, I, for some reason, I noticed that I, I was, I was raised by a, an amazing father, an incredible man, loving mother, remarkable woman. Um, and I, re I recall, I recall once when someone made something, made a statement and that made me think uh, as a young girl uh, or young woman. And she said, listen, I, I tend to see and notice that every time I have been around uh, where there's been chaos, either fights or, and I'm talking about very, very intense altercations, violent altercations, I tend to see you. You seem to be, you seem to be present. It's almost as though you're like the angel that appears wherever there is a, a, a chaos or trouble. Why? Um, now, I, wouldn't, I will not say, I cannot say that a statement was correct. Um, but it wasn't because I was always fighting and getting involved. It was, it was partly two reasons. One, I had friends. I had people I associated with. And remember, if you're raised... In difficult circumstances you are on the streets and so in many ways i don't want to make an excuse but i was i was always uh, never shy away from i never backed away i never started a, a, an altercation but i never backed away and i was always around um and so i decided to to, to join martial arts i joined karate and part of the reason i joined was because it it wasn't because of what she said what occurred to me was, well, hmm, she had made a, an interesting observation. But what occurred to me was this. Hmm. Mensa, since you are always in fights, or around where there are fights, or around chaos, either by choice or by happenstance, why don't you learn how to be an exceptional fighter so that you do your damage more elegantly? and with less effort and energy. That was my motivation. I joined martial arts because I thought, well, if I'm going to be around fight always, I'm going to fight, I may as well learn how to do, take a punch and also throw a punch. I started um, martial arts um, and I was stunned. On the first day, my attitude was different, it was wrong. I didn't come in good faith because my intentions were not pure. Second day, third day, fourth day, first week. And I started to notice a change. I'm going to share um, what is considered at the heart of Shotokan Karate. Um, it's like a pledge. There are five parts to it. I wouldn't say it in Japanese, although it is said in Japanese. Um, because most of my audience are not Japanese, so I won't bother you with that, but it's said in Japanese. At the end of every class, so you walk into a dojo or the space, and you bow. As soon as you walk in, you bow. In other words, you're actually saying, honoring the, the atmosphere, the, the presence, the, 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 the floor. 
But when the class starts, we all line up and we bow to the sensei. Then we start training. But at the end, we acknowledge the sensei, we acknowledge everyone who is present, and we also acknowledge whoever is the grand master. But we then we say what we consider to be our pledge, our motto, five. What is interesting is that it's not said as one, two, three, four, five. They all start with the number one. I've talked about the power of integrity in so many sessions. One. The old Israelite said, um, what was the first commandment? Hear, O Israel, the Lord. The Lord our God is one. Integrity. The Trinity. One. Your words, your deeds, your actions should be the same. So in martial arts, five. One. Seek perfection of character. One, be faithful. One, endeavor. One, respect others. One, reflect, refrain from violent behavior. Now, as I said this from day one and day two and day three, you know, I started to see a shift in my behavior, my personality, my attitude. I went to learn martial arts so I could learn how to cause more harm to other people on the streets. I left every class recognizing that I was supposed to be a person of restraint and respectful. Seek perfection of character, be faithful, endeavor, respect others, refrain from violent behavior. One, integrity. And you were supposed to be an, a personification of all of that. And what I noticed was here I came to a, a class and I had a sensei, and I started learning discipline, group interaction, rough and tumble play in a respectful manner, learning my power, learning other people's power, learning how to play, but also allow for the play to continue beyond one particular session. If, if you knock the person out and they are out for two weeks, then you don't have anybody to spar with. So it was all about learning, getting better, pushing yourself to the edges, allowing yourself to be tested, but respecting the art of play. And I found I changed. Suddenly I stopped being around places where there was violence or fights or trouble. I moved away. Why? I was around other men, other boys from a young age, and I saw myself in them. And I was I was I was led, I was guided, I was encouraged, I was I was I was even encouraging other people, people of my age. So first is join a boy scout, number two is martial arts. Martial arts extends. You have to learn how an art. The reason because of the discipline, the delayed gratification, the, the dopamine that comes from going through grades, being tested, learning your mistakes, being around people who sharpen you. Iron sharpens iron. I can look at the people you're most around and I can tell your character and your likely actions. People influence us subtly or overtly. Martial arts could be boxing, and I love boxing. Why? Because the old boxing schools, they teach you basic skills. You learn under someone. You walk in and the sensor says, well, you're late, 150 press-ups. Now, I've been to so many sessions where I'm late by a few seconds. And by a few seconds, I simply mean I'm late, I walk in, and my sensei has already gone to the front and everyone has lined up and they've already bowed. As soon as that starts, you can't join the class. You have to wait until they finish the bowing. And he says, you can warm up. But he says, you're late. 50 press-ups in front of the class. And what I found was you could see younger men. And I'm talking about when I had done this for so many years. At the time, this occurred. <laughs> this is fascinating. This occurred until I was even 40 past my 40s, where my sensei, didn't matter that you were amongst, you might say, the best in the class, the most senior in the class, it was fascinating to see respect given where he was due. 50 press-ups, because you were late. And the young ones who had just joined saw you being the older student, being disciplined, and you showing honour, and taking the discipline, and actually being uh, apologetic about 
the disrespect by being late. I saw that happen as a young child. And I saw that, ex experienced that looking backwards. And I always found very similar to the Scouts, you have people of every age. But what you were doing is you were supposed to be an embodiment of what should be right. That integrity. So boxing, karate, or any form of martial arts, taekwondo. I do like the idea of learning how to fight standing up and learning how to fight on the ground. I do both. Um, grappling, jiu-jitsu, or wrestling, even judo. I think for younger men, younger boys and girls, rough and tumble play is so important. So I would recommend the likes of grappling or jiu-jitsu uh, or wrestling because you learn the game and the art of knowing when someone taps out and says, I'm done. You got me, I'm done. Martial arts and karate was about speed, timing, power. Uh, it wasn't about, you know, the art of setting traps. It's not like playing chess. I consider the likes of jiu-jitsu to be very intelligent. You set traps. Sometimes the biggest person doesn't win. Sometimes the smart person who lays the right traps is the one who wins. The point of all of this is that you have to learn how to be in a group. Learn how to fight so that you can understand your emotions, learn how to control your emotions, learn how to use your emotions positively, but also be a force. Be a force. Uh, and if I look back in my life, I, I said, after a few weeks of training, I realized and I said to myself, I'm never going to allow that young man, uncontrolled, uh, to ever surface. And I made a promise to myself that I'll always stay in integrity. Now, make no mistake, I avoided altercations because I learned how to control my emotions. But I was always willing to make an exception. Um, to go back to that old life, uh, but also to utilize the skills I had learned in the period uh, to affect what I considered to be, to, to be um, necessary. But before I got to that stage, I had, I had calibrated my mind and I had conditioned my emotions and my temperament so much so that it, I could walk away and you could push me and I'll walk away and I'll walk away and I'll walk away. And even if you push me to the wall, perhaps I could climb the wall just to avoid you because there is no gain from a fight. The purpose of a fight is to see who is the better fighter. Sometimes some people know before the fight begins. Not that they will win, but that they can take a punch. And when you meet someone who's, who knows and who says, you know what, I can take a punch and I'm not afraid. Those are fights you should avoid because there is no victory from a fight if you can avoid it. But I found that I, by going to Boy Scouts and going to karate and learning martial arts and learning how to fight on my legs, standing up, and learning how to fight on the ground, grappling and jiu-jitsu, I learned the art of roughhousing. But the key part was emotional control, emotional discipline and restraint. I recommend martial arts to everyone from the preschoolers, those who are seven and above, all the way even to your 40s and above. It's good for your health, just for the health, um, for the well-being, being part of a group, group affiliation, learning. And here's the key thing. What I found the most important and perhaps the most nourishing is as I graded and I increased in my belt, I realized and I was gifted with the opportunity and I was honored with opportunity to teach what I had learned. You get to black belt, now you get to teach. But you don't have to wait until you're black belt to teach. You can teach from yellow belt teaching up who knows a white belt. You could be a blue belt teaching someone who is young or brown belt, um, depending on your art. The point being the ability to pour your life into another person, just like someone else has poured your life, their life into you. Critical. Now, the third thing I'm going to talk about, now this takes me away. Remember, I started with the Boy Scout, younger age, martial arts. There's an overlap. You can start at seven and you can carry on until your 60s and 70s, which I hope I will be able to do if I'm gifted with life. The third is muscle and your mind. 
I go back to my childhood experience. When I started doing martial arts, I also joined a local gym. Why? I was idle. An idle mind is a devil's workshop. And I realized part of the reason I was always around things that were, were not necessarily con consistent with my upbringing was because I was bored. I had nothing to do. Great father, great mother, but I was still bored. You come back from school, you're bored. And so I joined a gym. The gym primarily was to keep me off the streets. I could only do martial arts for an hour and a half every day. I needed somewhere else to go. I didn't want to go drinking. I didn't want to go smoking. So I joined the gym. And here is where perhaps I think it's a fascinating experience. When I started going to the gym, I joined the gym with the very old school um, trainers. It was, in, it was a part of the stadium, uh, just an open space, and there were equipment. And here were these big people, big muscles, and professionals. These were professionals representing uh, associations and sometimes representing countries for uh, powerlifting. You had the, the team, uh, the athletics team, come train in the same place. So you saw all of these people evolve, you saw them getting pushed. You saw the trainer saying, You've missed your personal best. Your personal best last month was X. You've occurred, you've achieved 10% less than your personal best. You're not growing. Next week, I need you to come back. I need you to sleep properly, eat properly, train in between, and I want you to achieve 5% above your last month's personal best. It was fascinating to watch. And here I was, joined the gym, knew absolutely nothing. And someone started teaching me. When you hold the bar like this, and this is the reason why. The muscle groups are set into X, Y, Z, Y, A, B, C. You're focused on this group, but as you're doing this particular exercise, you're building the primary muscle and the secondary muscle. This is how you do it. Watch me. And then I would watch them and they would correct me. And so I started using the, the gym to keep me off the streets. So here I was, martial arts and muscles. And I was happy. Happy because I was Avoiding temptation. If you avoid temptations, then the likelihood of making or falling into a hole is less. In any case, I, I, I developed a, a lifestyle. It was never about aesthetics, never has been. It became a conditioned habit. If you do something for 90 days consistently every single day, your, your subconscious mind develops uh, a behavior, a routine, a habit. Uh, a ritual that it understands and is programmed to repeat. So going to the gym is not optional for me. I don't think about, oh, it's raining or it's snowing or it's too hot. It's necessary. So it's, it's edged into my integrity. Remember when I talked about the one fives in karate, the motto, what you believe in. Now, I shared this simply to say something. As a young man, one of the things you would have to understand is what I call the three S's for young men. Success, sports and sex. Success from the perspective of academic success and, and doing well. And sports is where you excel and people know you. And then hopefully at some point you're hoping to find a date. By combining martial arts and the scout, you learn how to be in a group, you learn how to interact with people, then you learn how to fight, then you learn how to discipline yourself not to allow your masculine physique to go to waste. Now, I'm not saying you carry weights at 7 and 10 and 15. No, you allow your body to, to grow naturally. As a matter of fact, I recommend this from about 18 upwards. And the, 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 the approach changes as you move from 18 to 19 because you have to allow your youth uh, to be used in the right way. Beauty lies in youth. You don't go lifting too heavy weights at a young age because, unfortunately, all that muscle can, can turn to fat. So you have to be technically very careful about what you do. But from 18 and above, you should be intensively training. Now you can start pre-18, but you should be careful not to lift heavy weights. Allow yourself to naturally grow into uh, its frame. You can do different exercises. You can run, you can do sit-ups, um, you can do calf raises. But generally, the, the physique, the frame, um, be careful about what you do the younger you are. Muscle and mind. I trained my body, but I did not train my mind. And herein lies 
what I consider to be a fascinating part of my journey as a young man. I went through life understanding the physical, but I hadn't developed the intellect. I hadn't, I hadn't developed my mind. And so whilst I was aesthetically sculptured in the way I wanted to look like, and whilst I understood that it would bring tests, sometimes it was a test of people poking at you to see whether they could take you out in a physical fight. I'd learned how to avoid those, but I learned how not to back too far away and how to stand forward and take a punch if needed. What I hadn't developed was my mind and how to think and my intellect, how to reason, how to use my memory, how to use my perspective, how to manage my ego. Um, I hadn't actually developed a sense of understanding about how the mind works. And so I made so many mistakes. I'm going to share an experience and I, I, I try not to go too far, but I understand I've been speaking for a while. On one particular evening, I'm sitting now in my, my, my room and I'm going through so much, the pain is unbearable. And uh, I pick up a book and I start to read. And as I read the book, I notice that I see that tears are rolling down my eyes. A shock initially. Unusual. Um, I tend to have a stoic nature. Two emotions and two feelings go through. One is an emotion, sadness. The second was gladness. The sadness was simply because I, I realized, oh shit. But let me talk about the gladness first. Remember I was in a poor state emotionally and generally. And here I am reading this and I find someone for the first time who was articulating in his words or in their words what they had gone through and their suffering. And it was similar to mine. But they also articulated the formula that they used to overcome their pain and suffering. So I found solutions. That was the glad, glad emotion. Immediately there was a feeling of sadness. I found it, but I feel sad. Why? That book had been sitting on my shelf for many years. It occurred to me at the instant that my ignorance and my suffering was a choice. We make mistakes, we make errors, we take risks, either by omission or by commission. I didn't have to suffer as much as I did. I had focused on keeping myself off the streets that I did not focus on my mind. And I paid years and years and years of, of prices. Um, and then it occurred to me, I found answers, but here was the key part of it. I had paid once already for that pain. I didn't have to pay twice. All I needed was recognizing that my experiences and the results I had achieved had come from my mistakes. And the best thinking I had had got me to this ditch that I found myself in. And someone else was giving me an opportunity to transcend my pain and suffering and to choose a different path. To take myself, to bring myself out of the, the pit. You know, you might even say, perhaps you've been sold to, to the, the caravan of um, uh, Ishmaelites. Maybe you never go from the pit straight to the, you know, uh, to, to, the, to the king's palace, to the throne. Sometimes you have to go through processes. And maybe I was being sold, um, but I knew I was moving. I found the information that would have taken me from the pit to Potiphar's house, or from Potiphar's house, maybe to the prison, from the prison perhaps, to the king's palace. You don't get to the throne or find answers without going through the process. But I had found a path and a way that seemed better than mine. And I recommend the same for you. Your way may not be working, and if yours is not working, then why don't you try using the ways that other people have shared? Some of the ones I share, if you think they can help you get to your goal, but have the humility and be bold in giving it a go. Now, Henry David Thoreau said, that if a person advances confidently in the direction of their dreams and they just imagine the life that they want to have, 
In other words, you only just have to give your best shot. A day will meet with success, unexpected, in uncommon hours. Someday you will wake up and say, I did it. You fall on your knees and start to weep. Why? Advance confidently in the direction of your dreams and endeavour to live the life you've imagined. Who knows? Someday, my hope to you, not too long, you will meet with success unexpected in uncommon hours. But to do that, here are three things you need. Number one, you have to know where you are. Number two, you have to know where you're going. Number three, you have to get going. The truth is like the centre of town. So many routes, but get going. Fail fast and fail early. Take ideas and implement them. If they do not work, toss them aside and try something new. But you have to move in the direction of your dream. And the vehicle for getting you from where you are to where you want to be is in your intellect. Now, we live in three levels. Uh, I talk about this generally. Some people call it the trinity. Spiritual, intellect, and physical. We are spiritual beings. We live in a physical body, but we have an intellect. The way we use our intellect enables us to have emotional experiences that edify or help us have an adventure in our life. A positive adventure. Your spiritual side of who you are, which is the greatest part of who you are, is unseen. The best part of you cannot be seen with the physical eyes. It's formless in nature. It is weightless in nature. It's perfect. But because we live in a physical world, we have to operate at the limitations of the physical world. So we tap into the spiritual world we can, but we use the intellect to help us bridge that gap. Your intellect comprises of several parts, your intellectual faculties, and you have to learn how to use your intellectual faculties the same way you have to learn how to use your sensory faculties, sight, smell, taste, touch, uh, and hear. A child has to be trained, covertly or overtly, to recognize sounds, the difference between music and noise. He has to taste and know what is mama's milk and what is doesn't taste too good. He has to touch and say that is mommy's breast and that is daddy's fingers. The child is trained. Your intellectual faculties, unfortunately, do not come with a manual. You have to seek the manual and you have to learn. Animals who are raised and born with instinct and the genetic code, they're perfect. They operate, which is why you can see a small little lamb born, sheep, and within a few minutes is walking with the mother. It knows what to do. Human beings, we have a mind, we have an intellect, we have the free will, we get to choose. We make of our environment what we wish. Sometimes we make it into the Garden of Eden, sometimes we make it into a paradise or heaven, sometimes we make it into hell. But you have to learn how to use your intellectual faculties. Imagination, will, memory, perception, intuition, and focus. All of that has to be learned. And what I have shared so far, Boy Scout, this is the fascinating part of this whole thing. The Boy Scout starts to teach you about how to use your imagination. Dream of something. You're going to collect the badges, six, seven, eight, but you're just in your first class. Martial arts teach you the same thing. You're a white belt, but you can become a black belt. Imagination. Then it tells you, you have to focus. To get there, you have to focus. But, you will go through challenges, get knocked down, get swept, beaten, dumped on the floor, tap out a few times. So in your memory, you have to record successes so that you can run back and draw from your confidence. You do a 180, you look at when you've done things right, and you use it to encourage yourself to move forward. Perception. One man stands in the prison and looks out and sees through the window, and all he can see are the prison bars stopping him from leaving. Another person looks out and he sees a beautiful sunset. Same prison, different perception. So in life, you have to learn how to see things differently. My channel is simply a different perspective. You don't have to like it. You don't have to be here. But look, it enables you to see a different perspective. Intuition is being able to use your spirit, the spiritual part of your personality to recognize energies the fact that everything is energy, life, matter, energy. 
vibrations, oscillations. So you can walk into a space and you can say, do you know what? The energy in this space, the aura, the aroma, the fragrance is ana. And you can walk into another space and you can say, the fragrance, the aroma is this ana. You can meet someone and say, mom, mom calls you on the phone and you know she hasn't said something and you know something is wrong. Resonance, frequency, vibration, attraction. That is part of your spiritual nature. That is where intuition comes from. Now, I've gone through all of this to explain something that I think is necessary there. All of this is not gifted to you as a young boy or even as a young woman. You have to learn. And dad and mom are not sufficient because that's not their role. Their role is to bring you to turn. Their role is to empower you where they can with the life foundation of depart from where you are. That's their role. Their role is not to give you and equip you with all of the knowledge needed to make your life successful. It's to give you the knowledge needed for you to learn how to think critically and go seek the additional knowledge you need for your dreams and goals. Your life is not predestined. Life is not a matter of chance or happenstance. Or it is a matter of choices. You get to choose. Now this brings me to number four, which is a faith-based community. I don't care which. I don't really care which. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, it doesn't matter. A faith-based community is not that I want you to choose the philosophy. It's that I want you to be around people. Life is about relationships, people, experiences, and journeys. Get around people who think different than you, who can pour into you than you. Now, I like the Judeo-Christian philosophy for several reasons. And I like the Bible. Why? Because in the Bible you have stories. It's just simply a compilation of stories. Good, bad and indifferent. But what you find is two sides of the ledger, like a, an accounting statement. A basic accounting ledger. People, who, people whose lives have served as examples of how to lead a better life and others whose lives are despicable. It shows that it doesn't matter where you start. Doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter where you womb you've come from, you can have a great experience. You can have a great father like David, a psalmist, a warrior, a man after God's heart, but have a useless son like Absalom. You can also have a stupid father like Saul, but have a great son like Jonathan. There's no way you start. It's what you make of yourself. You can be a boy who was raised and placed by the Nile to die, or perhaps like Moses. Or you can be Saul, who on the road to Damascus became Paul and had an enlightenment and came to say the things I once hated are now love. And the things I used to love are now hate. You get to choose the story you hold on to. But what it shows you is people's lives um, that could be used as examples, but also could be used as warnings. So it doesn't matter what religion you choose, what faith-based community you choose, but it is important for you to be part of something greater than yourself. Let me finish with a recommendation number five. Everything I've said so far, I hope you've noticed, from Boy Scouts to martial arts, to muscles and mind, and then finally the faith-based uh, faith community. You were learning, you, you, you were going to places where people could pour their lives into you, and you were receiving. Receiving is not complete until something is given. In order to give, you have to receive. You've received so far, but here is a recommendation. Irrespective of where you find yourself, whether you're seven or nine or 15 or 35 or 40 or 50 or an old man, you have to pour back the gift of mentoring other people. Irrespective of where you find yourself. If you're five, you mentor someone who is four. If you're 10, you mentor someone who is nine. And you look for a way to pour back the little you have. Whatever you believe in life, Study, practice, teach. 
calling to the next person. Now, I shared with you an important part of my life. Someone poured into me at every stage. The reason I have this channel and I, I teach with a passion is because where would I have been if none of those people were there at that pivotal moment to pour into my life? I encourage you to become the mentor you seek by pouring to someone else. If you can follow these five stages, whether you start at seven or you start at 29 or start at 40, what you will find is that you have the opportunity to make life more meaningful by investing your life in another person or by allowing another person to gift you the gift of giving and the gift of love. Now, I hope that's been useful.